Okay, so uh, everybody should be in. Um, thanks again for being here. So what we have now is, um, well, let me remind again the rules. So uh, please, if you have a question, post it in the chat or uh, raise hand uh, in the, um, using the, the, the Zoom feature. And uh, uh, let me introduce the, the next uh, speaker. So the next speaker is uh, Arsham Gavazie, who is a PhD student at University of Trento and uh, Fondazione Bruno Kessler, who works on uh, um, network science, statistical physics, and uh, uh, complex systems in general. And uh, today is giving a tutorial on, the, on uh, complex networks. So uh, please, um, Arsham, thank you very much for uh, with us. And uh, yes. Great. Hello and welcome to this tutorial on complex networks. This would be a very brief introduction to network science, a science that has application to a broad range of disciplines. So no matter you are from a sociology background or physics, biology, economy, ecology, probably at some point in your future career or academic life, you will encounter networks and it's better if you have the basic backgrounds to understand what's going on in network science. So first, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me as a tutor. I'm Arsham, I'm a PhD student at Trento University and I really hope that this lecture would be uh, something of value to you and also you enjoy uh, this time that we are having together. Um, let's go a little bit into the details of this talk. This is the content. First, I'm going to talk about complex systems with you. You all know complex systems. Complex systems are everywhere around you. You just need to learn how to identify them and how to uh, characterize them by their important properties. Then we move to a structure and discuss the structure of these wonderful systems and after that we can talk about the basics of networks because we model the structure of these systems as networks we talk about uh, the features of real world networks we consider only two or three important features for this short tutorial although there's a lot more to learn about the common features of these large scale networks. After that, I elaborate a bit on the concept of node centrality, which is just to answer the question that which node is the most important one in the network. So you have a network, you want to rank the nodes according to their importance. How to define importance? We will talk about it, but it's ill posed question. So you can define the importance in different ways based on uh, what problem you are going to solve with these definitions. After that, we move to uh, network formation. What processes are underlying the network growth, network formation, how these networks emerge from the uh, small scale interactions between the nodes. And at the end, I will cover a very, um, I will provide a very short glimpse at the problem of network robustness, which is a very important problem because as you might guess all systems in nature are in danger of damage and it's important to know if a system is robust or not so this is a very uh, brief look at the contents of this talk i'm going to introduce two uh, references for this science for the network science these books are loved across the world so um, it really depends on your taste which of them uh, you would choose network science book by barabasi is probably easier to understand so if you are from a non-mathematics background i mean if you are not physicist or uh, computer scientist or mathematicians uh, a mathematician, perhaps you will prefer Barabasi book. Also, there is a networks and introduction by Professor Newman from Michigan. 
And this book is a little bit uh, harder to grasp and contains a lot of details that are probably more uh, interesting to people from uh, mathematical backgrounds. So it really depends. It's a preference to choose between them. We are going to talk about complex systems. So complex systems, by definition, are large collections of entities that interact in non-trivial ways. And they are characterized by their emergent properties, which means that their properties cannot be understood if you take the system into parts and study their parts. You should always consider the system as a whole and take a systemic view to understand what go what's going on in these systems. And these systems appear across disciplines. So you can see them in sociology, economy, physics, or biology. And perhaps that's why uh, famous scientists like Stephen Hawking has said that this century is the century for complexity science. So probably you are learning something really important. Some examples of complex systems are shown in this slide, um, like the brain, that is probably the most miraculously complex system in the world. And it contains a collection of neurons. So there is a large collection of, collection of neurons that are interacting in different ways using different uh, neurotransmitters, electrochemical signals. And from this system emerges uh, consciousness, memory, and other properties that you cannot learn by studying neurons in isolation. The same holds for our societies. So we are uh, exchanging information in forms of text and voice messages. And uh, our largest scale behavioral patterns are not yet fully discovered. We cannot claim that we understand human behavior. Also, there is transportation systems, uh, biological systems like protein-protein interaction networks or predator prey uh, interactions in nature, and also map of airlines. They all show complex systems. And you should have really a systemic view to, to, to be able to say something about these systems and to understand them at some point. All these systems exhibit structures. What do I mean by structure? So if you take a look at this uh, network of neurons, this um, bunch of neurons connected together on the left side, you see that the connections between them are not random. So each neuron is connected to a specific set of other neurons and they are exchanging information. And there is something like a structure that is determining their uh, relationships with one another. The other example is, for example, for um, instance, Twitter. You can see in the middle a uh, network of people that are exchanging information. On Twitter or Facebook, you are friends with a certain number of people and uh, you are disconnected from the rest of the world. There is a structure and a, a pattern of connectivity around every individual and uh, this structure brings people together and um, you know restricts the flow of information between them. The third example is a network of animals. This is the predatory prey relationships between different animals. As you can see, fox doesn't eat mice. It eats rabbit. And the rabbit eats carrots. But, uh, you know, it's not that everyone is eating everyone. So there is some patterns and regularity there. And this system has a structure. These structures are often modeled by networks. So uh, just to uh, tell you briefly, neural networks or neural networks just show you how these neurons are connected together. Social networks are just representing the structure of um, a network like Twitter. And also food web is there to represent the asymmetric way animals are uh, 
interrelated in a, a predatory prey relationship. From here, we are safe to move into the basics of the networks. To um, get a clear view of the structure of complex systems. So a network is basically a set of nodes and links. Nodes are those blue circles that you see. They represent the entities or units or components of a complex system. For example, in brain, it's, uh, they show neurons or brain regions. In social networks, they show people. In uh, food web, they show animals. And then links show how two nodes are interrelated. So um, if node one is uh, in some way connected to node B, then you put a line between them and it, it defines a link. There is um, different terminologies in this domain because the science is old and you know there is social networks, there is graph theory, there is network science, there is complex networks. So depending on the background, people use different terms. In physics, we almost always say node and link. In mathematics, people usually say vertice and edge. In social science, people say actor or connection. People use these words, uh, these words interchangeably, but they are all referring to the same thing. So they are really the same thing. I'm putting it there because uh, many people get confused while uh, reading uh, texts on network science. The important point of this slide is that networks represent the structure. Without networks, we miss a systemic view. And also the number of links attached to each node is important, and we call it degree. Degree is the number of connections each node has, and uh, it will come important in the next slides. One distinction you need to be able to make is between asymmetric and symmetric networks. So in, a, in an asymmetric network, the connections between nodes can be asymmetric. It means that maybe I am your friend, or, but you are not my friend. So there is a one-sided relationship between us. And this is an example for a social system, but in many other domains, you can see asymmetric networks. And you need to uh, use directed networks to represent asymmetric connections. As you can see on the left side, section A, we are observing arrows going from nodes to nodes. So for example, let's take a look at node D and B. Node D is connected to node B, but node B is not connected to node A, D. So this is a type of asymmetric um, relationship between the two nodes, while in the network uh, uh, represented in section B, you can see that there is no arrows, there is only lines, so every node is in um, a bidirectional relationship with uh, every other node to each it is uh, attached. So we have directed and undirected networks. And uh, another concept is that, as I told you in the last slide, the number of connections each node has defines its degree. Here, we can have two different definitions of degree. You can take a look at the connections inward and call it in degree, and you can take a look at the connections outwards and call it out degree. For example, let's take a look at node B in the directed network. As you can see, there is two arrows entering node B, so the in degree for node B would be two. And there is one arrow emanating from node B, which defines its out degree. So the out degree for node B is one. Of course, for undirected networks, we don't have out degree or in degree, there is only degree. Examples can be food web. In food web, animals often are either prey or predator. So uh, their relationships between every pair of animal 
can be better shown by an arrow rather than a line. But then in WhatsApp, you are either in contact with someone uh, in a bi-directional way or you are not. It's very low probability that you are connected to someone who doesn't respond at all to your text. So in WhatsApp, probably you want to consider the structure to be undirected. There is weighted networks and binary networks, and this is important to learn the distinction. It really depends a lot on how much information you have about the system. So if you know that, um, for example, in a social system, Fred and George are friends, but you, know, you don't know how much friendship there is. You can't... Um, compare the friendship between Fred and George with other people. You only know that they are friends. You define the network to be binary. So you make a link between Fred and George and every other people that you know to be friend. And uh, for sure, for people that are not friends, you don't draw the line. There is no link. It defines a binary network. In weighted networks, in contrast, you know how much friendship there is between two people. So. For example, you measure how many text messages are exchanged between Fred and George. You see that it would be like uh, 10 messages per day. You compare it to other people and you decide whether uh, the weight of connection between Fred and George is high or is low. And then um, you get a weighted network in which there is more information compared to the binary version. To represent them, people uh, often use the thickness of the links. So a link with higher weight is uh, represented thicker, and the tinier links show the uh, weaker connections between pairs of nodes. This is the distinction between weighted and binary networks. Another important definition is the definition of path. So imagine that you are on a certain node of a network and you want to navigate your weight to another certain node. So let's take, for example, node A and node B. And um, to do that, you need to jump from uh, the node on which you are, go through a link and uh, land in a neighboring node and continue it. So you move through a sequence of links and you eventually reach node B. So paths are just a sequence, uh, sequences of links, and uh, they can be of different length depending on how many links you have passed uh, to get to your uh, target. So there, you can choose a very long path, like a huge number of links to reach node B, or you can just go through the shortest possible path that connects node A to node B. Perhaps one can argue that the shortest one is the most efficient, whether it is really a transportation network when you want to change the flights to get from New York to Sao Paulo, and you want to get to uh, your target in, a, in the fastest way, or um, it can also be neurons in human brain that want to exchange information and it would be probably much more efficient if they choose the shortest path to communicate. So finding the shortest path connecting every pair of nodes becomes something of importance. And there's a lot of algorithms to calculate and compute the shortest path between every pair of nodes in a network. It's not easy, so you need to find a, uh, an efficient algorithm because especially if your network is very large, um, finding shortest path has become very time consuming and computationally costly. Another important concept is transitivity. So as you can see, on the right, there is a network of unconnected nodes. The second picture from the right is showing a connected pair A and C while B is isolated. The open triad example is where B is connected to A and C, but A and C are not connected together. And there is the closed triad. This is basically 
a triangle. And this is very important because, uh, again, in a social network example, you can think of yourself being friend with Fred and George, two other person, and you want to calculate the probability that if you are friend with both of them, they are friend with one another. So you are shaping a triad, a closed triad. This is very important um, because it shows how densely connected people are around you. And um, to measure it on a large network, you only need to count the number of triangles or closed triads and divide it by the maximum possible number of triangles in that network. So it gives you, for example, 60% or um, 0 0.6, then you say that my transitivity in this network is 0 0.6, and uh, you can compare it with another network and um, obtain that the other network has 0 0.8 transitivity. You can conclude that in the second network, the connections around people are more dense. They are more likely to be in uh, close triads, like uh, three body interactions in physics. So we move to probably one of the most important yet uh, very simple concepts, which is modularity. This is a network you can see that there is two groups of nodes, two communities that are almost separated from each other while they are very connected inside within each of these communities. The red community represents the people with more tendency towards conservative parties. This is America, so it is showing the Republicans. The blue party, of course, is Democrats. And you can see that people inside the party tend to make connections with similar people, with people of similar ideas and similar political thinking. So as you can see, there is uh, two modules formed in this network. And there are algorithms that allows you to uh, find the modules in network, find the communities, find how strong these communities are, meaning that how separated they are from other communities. This is not um, compulsory that a network has two communities. So a network can, has, can have a lot of communities and um, this is just an example because political system in America is um, has two poles generally. So that's why you see two communities here. Again, there is a lot of algorithms and uh, there is no consensus that which of these algorithms are better but um, you can use these algorithms to find the community structure of your network. Now, uh, Dr. Gavosiet, can I ask a question? Uh, sure, sure. Let me just share the video and stop sharing here. Okay, so I'm here. Yeah, so. Um, okay. I wanted to ask you about the difference between transitivity and connectivity. And what? The difference between transitivity and connectivity. So how okay. do you... In okay, in so uh, connectivity is just the number of edges you see in the network, the number of links divided by the maximum possible number of links, okay? Yet the transitivity is about the triangles. So. Connectivity is about the interaction between a pair of nodes, while the transitivity is about um, a, a triangle, three nodes. So and this is, of course, in a very dense network, they two are high simultaneously. But then in uh, sparse networks, it can be different. So in a sparse network, you can have high transitivity while low connectivity. So how would you interpret high, high transitivity but low, like low, uh, high transitivity but low connect connectivity? So how do I interpret it? I don't, I'm not sure if I uh, correctly get the question, but anyways, around every person, 
there is uh, you know a community of highly um, uh, uh, of densely connected people but um, perhaps globally if you think of network it's uh, the connections between uh, different communities is low compared to a null model or a typical network so i have to probably uh, dr greeley should i answer all the questions or should i put it under so uh, if you want you can ask you can answer uh, now so i remember the participants that if they want to ask the question to okay okay so Probably I will move ahead, but at the end we will have 15 minutes to. So there, to there is a question about the slide that you just showed. So if you want, uh, I can ask it now. But uh, mm -hmm. okay, okay, let's go. So it was, uh, it's really, I, I think, a, a rapid question. So you showed this plot about uh, the two parties in the U.S. and mm -hmm. there were some yellow links. Mm -hmm. What do they represent? This is a question. Okay, so there is other parties in America, and I think they are libertarians. I'm not sure, but uh, they belong to other parties. Yeah. But they are, you know, uh, the density of them is really low compared to the two big parties. Yeah. Great, I think that answered the question. So please go ahead and again, remind the participant to use the raise and button to- uh, Okay, okay, so I will go ahead with the talk. And... real world networks because in real world we are observing networks for two decades and now we can say that these networks are showing um, unusual and extremely interesting um, characteristics they are similar in one way or another and I'm going to discuss three features that is that are common among a lot of networks so the first feature is a small wordness. As you can see on the left, there is a network with regular pattern of connectivity. So you can really see that there is a symmetry between every pair of nodes. Each node is connected to its neighbor and to its second neighbor, but not connected to any other nodes. This is a regular network. You can get the pattern by a loop. One point is that there is no difference between curved links and straight links. They both are telling the same. It's just a matter of representation. On the right side, on another hand, there is random network. As you can see, there is no pattern of connectivity. Everyone is randomly connected to everyone. And um, it's chaos there. In the middle, you see the small world network. So there is the pattern, there is the regularity, but there also you there also you can observe some irregularities, some randomness, and this randomness is um, represented in terms of long range connections connecting distant nodes of the network. This is the topology of small world networks. They are between regularity and randomness and um, they have a lot of important properties that are good for complex systems. For example, they have high transitivity, uh, which is related to the number of closed triads, as I told you in the last slides. And the average shortest path connecting pairs of nodes is relatively low. So this would be easy to navigate your way from each of the nodes and reach another one. And that's why these networks are often considered as efficient. They are observed in multitude of systems uh, from brain networks to social networks. And the model of a small world has been used to justify many observations people have done on uh, real world systems. So small worldness is a characteristic of real world networks. There is heterogeneity. It means that in real world networks, often there is a lot of nodes having only a few connections. As you can see, most of the nodes in this network um, have only one connection or two. And then there is a very tiny minority having a lot of connections, as you can see. 
this is a node A and C in this example, having each of them have okay, about eight or even more links connected to them. So they have high degree. And um, that's why we are calling them heterogeneous networks or scale free networks. So these heterogeneous networks are uh, reminiscent of what we observe in economy, as you can um, imagine, or you know, probably, the distribution of wealth between people is uh, somehow power law, meaning that it's heterogeneous. There is a tiny minority having a lot of money, while most of people in the world are poor. So the distribution of degrees in these networks are important. They follow a power law distribution. If you are a physicist or a mathematician, uh, you probably know what a power law is but it's a signature of a scale-free behavior in the system or a scale-free systems. That's why we call these type of heterogeneous systems scale-free. So a network can be heterogeneous, but not be a scale-free, but let's forget this distinction now. And from now on, I will call heterogeneous networks like this, scale-free networks. The other element is hierarchy. As you can see here in this picture, there is five communities. Each of them consists of five nodes that are interconnected in a dense way. And these communities are just all of them connected to the community in the center. So the community in the center has somehow access to all other four communities, but the communities on the peripheral part are not having the same access. That's why uh, we call this network a hierarchical modular network. And there is the element of control in these networks. So the top module probably can uh, control some properties or some information processing going on in the lower modules. So this is the third feature of complex networks that I was uh, intending to share with you. I hope that uh, you have now an idea of the common properties of some of the common properties of real world networks. And now we are probably safe to go to the topic of centrality. So what is node centrality? You have a network and it's a mess. Believe me, when you look at the networks in your computer, you cannot really uh, say many things based what is the most important node in the network? Or what is the most important connection or link in this network? And um, you want to find the ranking of nodes based on their importance. This is a very abstract network represented here. It can be a network of neurons, individuals, proteins, and you want to know which of them are the most influential, important, or whatever different definition of being critical for the system you have in your mind. Also, you might ask uh, which synapse in a neuronal network is the most important or which social connection or which biological interaction is the most important uh, link, defines the most important link in my network. And to answer this question, you first need to define the relative importance. How do you define it? So. This is something to, uh, that's worth thinking about. And it really depends on the type of the system, the type of question you have in your mind. But I'm going to give you um, some of the most important yet simplest definitions of node centrality. Probably you have guessed this one because it's quite trivial. You want to know what node is the most important. You calculate the degree of each node, and you would say that the node having the most number of uh, connections or the highest degree is probably the most important one. Here in this example, uh, I highlighted the node with uh, red. So you can see the highest degree centrality node is node J. and 
you can really make the case that these nodes are very important. Like in social networks, imagine someone having million, millions of uh, friends and connections so they can have really an impact on how society thinks about different things. The same example happens in protein-protein interaction networks and brain uh, and also any other complex system that you can possibly think of. So degree centrality is a way to rank the node um, and say that, okay, this one is more important than the other one. The second definition of centrality I'm going to discuss here is closeness centrality. So you calculate the average distance of each node from other nodes. To do that, you need to compute the shortest paths connecting each node to any other node and average the length of these shortest paths. And you will find one of the nodes that has a very low average compared to others or um, the one that is simply closest to the rest of the networks. And you would say that this node is probably the most important according to closeness centrality. In this example, this is node P. To uh, really calculate it, you need a computer or you need to really write pages of calculation for this network, um, even though the size of the network is relatively small. So um, there is algorithms, as I told you before, to calculate the shortest path, and there is algorithms to derive the closeness from the shortest path. Another way to define the centrality is really to find the middle guy. So imagine that you are working in a physics department in a university and you want to have some collaboration with biologists from another department. And to do that, you usually find the middle guy, the guy who works between the two departments. Maybe he is a physicist, she is a physicist, or he or she is a biologist. Uh, it's not important. It's uh, the only important part is point is that he is the middle guy. He knows everyone from both departments. He can introduce you to many people. He can uh, speak the language of both departments. So the middle guy is really important. Also in brain, if you think of two brain areas that are trying to exchange signals, there probably is a middle region that the signals should travel through it and it should pass the signal from one region to another. So the betweenness of nodes in network is important. And as you can see here, it's quite graspable visually that node H has high betweenness. It's connecting more or less two patches of nodes. Uh, and this is another way that you can think of the importance of nodes in a network. So here we are moving to the subject of network formation. I'm going to discuss two theoretical models of how network can be formed. What are the mechanisms underlying the growth of networks in nature? They are very complicated and uh, probably much different from these two theoretical ones that I'm going to introduce. But the theoretical models are uh, providing some insights into the system. This is the random uh, connection. This is a very simple model. You can see on the left side, there are there is a lot of nodes that are totally disconnected. Then you add links with probability. So you add link with probability zero, there is no links added, so the nodes are disconnected. In contrast, on the right side, you can see that all nodes are connected to all other nodes. So you are in a, a regime where probability of connectivity is equal to one. Then moving from the left side to right side, you are increasing the connectivity probability and you will see that there would be 
different patches of nodes that are connected inside, but they are not connected outside. They are not connected together. And the number of these patches would uh, decrease as you increase the probability of connectivity. And at some point, there will appear a large giant component, a component that is very big, and it's integrating all the network together, and the network would be formed after that point. Uh, the point of the point at which the giant component emerges is called the critical probability, has been shown by PC, and uh, the size of the largest connected component in the system is a measure of how uh, this phase transition from disconnectedness to integrity happens, as you can see in the plot. On the bottom, um, this is the size of the largest connected component. You are increasing the probability of connectivity. But firstly, there is not a real change in the size of the largest connected component. The size of largest connected component is uh, basically the number of nodes you can see in the largest connected component. So this is not really zero. It fluctuates, but this is approximately zero before critical probability. And then after critical probability, you can find uh, that the giant component appears and then integrates the whole network. So this is only uh, a formation model based on uh, adding links with probabilities. And uh, from it, you see the interesting behavior of the giant components. The other model is preferential attachment. And this is very similar to the idea of rich gets richer. So you start from one or two nodes, you add nodes, each of the nodes that is added in one specific step gets connected to the existing nodes in the network with probabilities. It is more probable that the newly arrived node gets connected to the node with the highest degree. So you can see that the node that has already the highest degree will increase its degree very fast. And you end up in a heterogeneous network where there is a tiny fraction of nodes with a lot of connections, while most of the networks, most of the nodes in the network are having only one or two links, as I told you in the last section. In this network, in this visualization, uh, the size of nodes is taken to be proportional to their degree. So the number of connections each node has determines the size of the node. As you can see, there is uh, five very big balls in this network. It means that they are hugely connected. And you can see a large number of uh, very small dots. Uh, representing how heterogeneous these networks are. From this preferential attachment, you can analytically derive the uh, probability distribution function for degree. So you can really show that uh, degree is uh, distributed in a power law way. Again, another emphasis on uh, how scale-free the networks in nature can be. People who are familiar with power laws from statistical physics or statistics will get what I say. It's mm, not a hard concept. You can really follow it from uh, Barabasi book on uh, the topic of network growth and preferential attachment. You will find the full derivation of how uh, the power laws are actually are obtained mathematically and what, the, what they mean. But I suffice to this for the moment because I don't have a lot of time. So the last part of this talk is about robustness. And robustness is uh, the study of how um, robust or tolerant the network is against failures inside or external attacks. So complex networks, because they are always in touch with Dismantled into pieces and the system will die. System wouldn't uh, maintain its function 
And it's very important to see how robust the uh, network is. So the procedure considered to model the uh, damaging uh, networks is just to remove nodes. So you either randomly or uh, according to an algorithm, you select nodes from the network, you remove them one by one, as you can see from the image on the top left, the network is whole. And then uh, you added the you you remove the node around which there is a green circle, and then in uh, the image on top right, you remove another bottom left. You remove the third one, and the bottom right shows uh, the network after removing these three nodes. As you can see, the network was connected in the first place, but it is now dismantled in the fourth place. Uh, into one, two, three, four, five disconnected components. And the size of the largest components here is just one, two, three, four, five, six. So the largest connected component contains only six nodes in the fourth step, while in the first step, it, con uh, it contains probably more than 20 nodes. I don't take the time to count all of them, but as you can see, the size of the largest connected component shrinks as you remove the nodes and as the network dismantles into pieces. So this gives you a criteria to um, measure the robustness of networks. Here is the example of a lattice, a regular lattice. So every node is connected only to four of its neighbors in a very regular way. And then uh, the size of the network, I don't know how much it is, but it would be probably around uh, uh, 300 or 1,000. So, and then you remove the nodes randomly. So you make a code to remove the nodes randomly and you will um, study how many disconnected components there is in your network. And uh, what is the size of the largest connected component? Of course, in the beginning, the size of the largest connected component is equal to the size of the network because everyone is connected to everyone. There is no different patches. There is no disconnected components. Then the number of disconnected components grows and the size of the largest connected component shrinks. As you can see, there is a phase transition again around uh, FC, the critical fraction. So you are removing about uh, 0 0.4 uh, of the total links. It means 40% of the total links. And you see that the size of the largest connected component goes to zero. So the network totally dismantles. There is no connections in the network after that. Uh, this is very important. So you can see that the lattice is not very robust against random failures, against random uh, removal of nodes. But in other types of networks, this is internet that has a scale-free uh, uh, topology. So the structure of internet is really a scale-free or heterogeneous for sure. You can see that the if you if you follow the green light, you can see that the network dismantles after like removing ninety percent of nodes. So this is very very shocking. Um, these networks are extraordinarily robust against uh, random failures, against random removal of nodes. As you can see, the largest connected component has mm, a large size, even after removal of 50% of the nodes. And this is weird. Um, so the take home message here would be the real world networks are probably robust against random failures and random attacks. While I'm going to get a bit into the details and I'm going to introduce you to the targeted attacks. So you can use the notion of centrality that I introduced in the last sections. And you can rank the nodes based on every centrality of your preference here. Um, the degree centrality has been chosen, meaning that each node is important according to the number of connections it has. 
And then you remove the node according to that ranking. So if this is degree centrality you are basing your attacks on, then you firstly remove the, high, uh, the node with the highest number of connection. Then you remove the node uh, that is second with respect to the number of connections. And you go ahead. The purple line shows uh, the response of system to targeted attacks. As you can see, you are removing um, around 10% of the nodes and the system collapses. It dismantles into pieces. There is no network after these attacks. This is very important. So um, this is, again, a heterogeneous network with parallel degree distribution. And we see the green light shows the random failures. So the scale-free networks are very robust against random failures, but they are not at all robust against targeted attacks. And um, it depends on the type of a study that you are doing. You might want to consider the random attacks. You, won't want to, you might want to consider the targeted attacks. You might want to base your attacks based on uh, base your attacks on uh, different types of centralities. So uh, these are the ways in which you can explore the robustness of networks in different situations. I'd like to finalize the talk here. Thank you very much for listening to me. Um, I will be ready for Q&A. Disclaimer, I'm not an ecologist. I'm not a biologist, but I'll be happy to answer your questions about network science. And also, I will try my best to answer your questions from other domains, from ecology, biology, sociology, but no promise. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Arsham. Thank you very much for this very uh, nice, broad, but yet compact introduction of a huge field. Thank you. So, um, perhaps I'll start uh, uh, asking some questions that are in the Zoom chat. And uh, please, if you have uh, any other, um, people have any other, uh, they can raise hand or ask them in the uh, YouTube chat if they're following from YouTube. So um, there is one question which I think is uh, fairly broad, which is, is uh, hierarchy always associated with modularity? Okay, so you can basically imagine networks that are not at all modular, but they are hierarchical. And uh, there are examples of that in nature. Um, but uh, when, I, when I'm thinking about complex systems like brain or societies, modularity is always there, hierarchy is always there. And it's um, common that these networks are not homogeneous. So that's why I picked these properties. So basically there can be networks with only hierarchy. Great. So um, there is uh, uh, another question uh, by uh, Deepak, uh, why is the central network, why is a central network called small world? So perhaps it's, yeah. Okay, so this is based on a very old experiment in the field of social networks. So long before physicists entered the, uh, the complex network domain, there was Milgram, a scientist who did a very famous experiment. You can search it on the Wikipedia, but it basically showed that um, uh, your distance from any other person in the world is very small. Like you are connected to every other person with only a few uh, number of other connections. So this is basically the shortest path between you and other people are very um, small. So, and um, the model that I showed you, that was something between the regular and the random network. This model was there to show how this is possible, how the small wordness emerged in the world, how we are really connected and uh, our distance is very short. Great, thanks a lot. So there is a question by Pablo. Uh, please unmute yourself and uh, you can ask it. Hello, um, thanks for this talk. It was really interesting. You mentioned uh, a, dem a derivation of the probability of, of the degree of a node when the network is, is constructed with preferential construction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and this is in the Barabasi book, but I looked it up and I can't find the chapter 
on network formation. I don't know if it... Okay, Professor Greeley, is there any place I can share um, documents with people that are interested in some? Uh, yes, I mean, you can send it to it. If it is something that you have in your hand now, you can share it in the chat. Uh, okay, no, I don't have it now, but uh, of, of course it's there in the book because this is the central claim of claim of uh, Professor Barabasi that networks are parallel. So uh, this is probably in that book, but um, for sure there is papers. Yeah, so and if you want, uh, we can uh, share material, uh, so links to paper, not the PDF, mm -hmm. they are mm -hmm. on the um, uh, on the website. So where the program? Great. So just send me an email and uh, sure. Uh, great. So there is uh, there are uh, we have time for a few more questions. So uh, there is a question. Um, where is this? Um, by Dionessa in the chat. So uh, what insights do we usually make from the distribution of between a centrality in the network versus the network robustness? And uh, is there any analytical way to get the critical FC for robustness? Okay, so the critical FC can be obtained for a specific topologies. And this is a very interesting topic to uh, discover if you are a physics fan and you like the networks. And the first question, I didn't get it. So what is the distribution of betweenness? Uh, the first question is, what insights do we usually make from the distribution of between a centrality in the network versus as opposed to, I guess, network robustness? Okay, okay. If I get the question correctly, please, please um, tell me if I'm mistaken. But if I get the question correctly, it's because I didn't really explain how to calculate the between a centrality. So between a centrality, you again have to calculate the shortest paths and you will, um, um, calculate how many shortest paths cr cross a link. That's how you generally say that the link is in between other nodes. So there is many shortest paths going through that specific link. This is how you can say that the betweenness of a, a node is high or low. And then uh, according to betweenness centrality, if you, if you base your targeted attacks on betweenness centrality, this is one of the you know, uh, best strategies of attacking the networks. It's probably probably the best among the at least classical uh, ways of attacking the network, and it dismantles the networks very fast, very quickly. Great. Uh, so, is there any other question? Ah. Uh, so. Uh, so I'm not, there is another question in the chat, which I'm not sure, but I'll, I'll read it. So it's. Can we combine network analysis with Markov chain by taking uh, into time? So I guess it's related to temporal networks, but I'm not sure. Okay, okay. So I will um, take this time to briefly talk about the dynamical processes on networks because this is um, you know, the subject I'm working on. So you can, um, you can have these structures, like imagine the neurons connected to each other, but you don't know how information travels from one node to another. Okay, so you can calculate the shortest path, but it's not really the way that electrochemical signals flow in the network. That's when you uh, couple the network with a dynamical process. It can be a random walk, it can be a continuous diffusion, it can be synchronization, and the nodes you know, uh, exchange information in terms of these dynamical processes. That's a very huge topic and I really enjoy it and I chose it to be my uh, you know, master's and PhD thesis. Great. Any other question? You're welcome. <laughs> this was a reply to a thank you in the chat. Yeah. Um, great. If not, uh, I think uh, I'd like to thank you to thank uh, Arsham very much again for this very nice tutorial, which will be available on YouTube for the for the next generations. And before.